webinar which has been organized by disability and development consortium india on poverty hunger and disability the missing link you know, you know uh, many, many years, years ago, ago i used to uh, use a, a quote, quote from, from dr, dr. amrit singh whenever, whenever talking, we're talking about uh, disability, disability and, and poverty, poverty. And, and that, that quote, quote I didn't, I didn't know, know that there's someone, someone who has actually worked with Dr. Dr. Amrit Singh. The next speaker who is going to talk about disability matters in world economics, economics is John, John Dress. Dress. And, and I'm, I'm not, not going, going to use the quote today because I'm pretty sure John, John is going to you to share, share that with you. you. If, if not, not, I'll share that. that. And about, about John, John, he is a development economist. Currently, currently visiting, visiting professor, professor at Karachi University. University. John, John taught, taught at the London School, School of Economics in the 80s, and, and he has made wide-ranging contributions, contributions to development economics, economics and, and public, public policy, policy with special, special reference, reference to India. You might, you might have, have seen, seen him on your TV screens, screens for many, many demonstrations. demonstrations. His, His recent, recent books include an American Uncertain, uncertain Glory, India and its Contradictions with Dr. Amrit Singh, and, and sense, sense and solidarity, Jolalala economics for everyone. He has, he has worked on many, many issues, including hunger, famine, education, gender, gender equality, equality, child care, child care school, school feeding, employment guarantee, etc. Et John is also active in various campaigns for economic and social rights. rights. He, he is, is well known for his commitment to social justice, justice both in, in India, India and internationally. He is someone who is known for his simplicity and the way of life he has chosen. He has not been keeping well. He has just come out of COVID. Yet, he is here for us to talk to us. Over to you, John. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for inviting me to be with you today. I'm actually fine. Uh, I have had occasional connectivity, connectivity problems, so if I'm disconnected, I will be able to reconnect quite quickly. I was actually initially a little reluctant to speak today because I'm not particularly knowledgeable on disability issues. But in the end, I'm glad that I accepted it because it forced me to think a little more about the link between poverty and disability and this opened my eyes to the fact that disability is a gaping hole in the economic literature on poverty and by extension in economic policy. Uh, the title I have given for this short talk is um, Disability Matters in Poor Economics. As many of you would guess, the term poor economics is borrowed from the title of a famous book by Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. And in that title, the term poor economics is not a reference to the poverty of economics, but rather it's a tongue-in-cheek reference to the economics of poverty. And that is the sense in which I will use the term today also. But as it happens, there is a sense in which disability issues draw our attention to the poverty of economics itself. I am thinking, thinking of the failure of mainstream economics, economics to pay adequate attention to disability as a form and as a source of poverty. You can see that the failure, in fact, in that very book itself that I mentioned for economics, which does not mention disability anywhere in the book of 300 pages of poverty, or for that matter, uh, in Martin Ravalian's uh, authoritative book, book called The Economics of Poverty, 400 pages, again, no mention of poverty. I'm not pointing fingers at that particular authors. I'm just illustrating the fact that disability is virtually invisible in the economic literature on poverty. Now, surprising as it may seem, poverty is not a very well-defined concept in economics. It's really like a proverbial elephant very easy, easy to recognize, recognize but, but not, not easy to not, not sorry, sorry very, very easy, easy to recognize, recognize but, but difficult, difficult to define. 
in the standard approach, poverty is simply seen as a lack of purchasing power, or if you like, a lack of money. Poor people are people who don't have enough money. In that approach, typically we set the poverty line in terms of per capita income or per capita expenditure, like so many rupees per month or so many dollars per day. And then anyone below that poverty line is considered poor. So for example, the World Bank often uses $1 a day or $2 a day at purchasing power parity as an international poverty line, and then uses that poverty line to estimate the number of poor people in each country. Now, this seems to make sense. I mean, we do think of poverty normally as a lack of money or purchasing power. But the problem with this approach is that it makes no allowance for the fact that different people have different needs, live in different environments, in different circumstances, and therefore the same amount of money may mean different things to the different people. If you live in a healthy environment, you are well educated, you are free from social discrimination, and you have access to basic public amenities like healthcare, clean water, and sanitation, you may be able to get by with much less than someone who lives in a more difficult environment. Similarly, if you are a disabled person, you are likely to have special needs for instance, for healthcare, for certain facilities, perhaps for a caregiver, and none of this is taken into account in standard poverty indicators. And indeed, there is no simple way of doing that. There is no simple way of making an allowance for people's different needs and circumstances. And that is why I say that poverty is not a well-defined concept in economics, because it seems to be a simple matter of purchasing power, but you can't take purchasing power at face value. I should mention that there is an alternative approach which focuses not on purchasing power, but on well-being, on the living conditions of people. In that approach, purchasing power is seen as a means to an end, not as an end in itself. And what really matters is not people's purchasing power, but their living conditions and well-being, for instance, whether they are well-nourished, whether they are free for, from illness, whether they are well-educated, whether they have shelter and clothing, and perhaps even whether they are free from oppression and discrimination. Now, this is the inspiration behind the so-called multidimensional poverty index. I don't want to go into the details of the index, but basically the idea is that you leave aside purchasing power and you look directly at various indicators of well-being, for example, nutrition indicators, uh, life expectancy, education levels, and so on. And then you make some kind of index of these well-being indicators and you use that to assess uh, poverty levels in different places or different times or between different groups. That has the merit of focusing on what really matters and not on purchasing power, which is, as I said, just a means to an end. It looks directly at people's living conditions. <clears throat> but the problem with that approach is that there is some inevitable arbitrariness in the choice of well-being indicators that we use and in the ways that we give to different indicators. So coming back to the standard approach, because it is a standard approach that dominates the entire poverty literature, including in India, <clears throat> the focus on purchasing power without any allowance for people's different needs, and in particular for the needs of people with disabilities, has the effect of hiding the poverty of persons with disabilities. And in that sense, I feel that persons with disabilities have been really shortchanged in the, in the economic literature on poverty. Things get worse when we look at practical applications of this standard approach, for example, in the so-called BPS census, the 
below poverty line census, census, which is a practical, practical attempt to identify households who are below the poverty line. line. And because we don't know how to measure people's incomes or expenditure directly, what we do is we look at proxy indicators, for example, how much land they own, their assets, uh, levels of education, and so on. And then we make some kind of we use some kind of scoring method to add up these proxy indicators and uh, uh, guess whether they are actually poor or not. Now that approach is unfair to persons with disabilities on at least four different counts. First of all, it ne neglects the fact that the ability that the that persons with disabilities have a lower ability to convert these assets into streams of earnings and income. Uh, for example, they may have a high level of education, but that may not translate into a good job, a well-paid job, because of the disabilities that they experience. And we know from national sample survey data that unemployment and earning levels among persons with disabilities are much lower than those of other groups in similar circumstances, except for those disabilities. Secondly, this approach neglects the fact that many persons with disabilities need a caregiver. In fact, according to National Sample Survey data, 62% of persons with disabilities in India have a caregiver. So again, a caregiver, because of the time being required to look after the person with disability, uh, may not be able to earn. So again, the earning capacity, uh, the lower earning capacity of the household that includes a member with disability is neglected in that approach. Thirdly, it neglects, neglects the special needs of persons with disabilities, like need for healthcare, need for uh, special facilities, and so on. This I have already mentioned earlier. And fourthly, it overlooks the fact that Quite often, the disability itself entails a loss, a loss of well-being, so that at a given level of income or expenditure, you may have worse living conditions, you may have lower level of well-being if you are uh, coping with disability than if you are not. So this entire approach is totally inappropriate when it comes to persons with disabilities. And, and we should remember that this BPL census and this BPL classification and the whole methodology behind it is still being used today. And in particular, it is still being used for identifying people eligible for pensions, including, including disability pensions. That may not be the case in places like Rajasthan, where, as Aruna has mentioned, the coverage of pensions has now been extended, extended well beyond the BBL category. But in a state like Jharkhand, where I'm sitting right now, it is still the BBL census that is being used to determine eligibility to pensions. And I was shocked to find today, when I looked at the latest data on uh, pensions under the National uh, Social Assistance Program, that the central program of social security pensions, that the number of persons who benefit from disability pensions under this NSCP is barely one and a half million uh, compared to uh, at least 28 million persons with disabilities in India, according to census data, and probably actually much more uh, in practice. So that's a, even if you accept the, the census figure of about 28 million persons with disabilities, the coverage of pensions would be barely 5%. Now, now that's, that's only the central contribution. By the way, the amount is also very well, as everyone has mentioned earlier. Uh, I think it's still 200 rupees per month in the remaining at that, that level for the last 15 years. years. Now, of course, as everyone has mentioned, mentioned, some states are topping up the central contribution. But even if you say, if you, if you take all the state schemes into account, according to national sample survey data, only 20% of all persons with disabilities in India benefit from any form of government support. And I think that reinforces the point that Aruna was making about the need to bring uh, these benefits into the rights framework and uh, guarantee state support to all persons with disabilities as a matter of right. Now, I think there is something really ominous happening right now as far as central policy is concerned. 
because, as I said, the coverage of disability pensions is stagnating, the amounts are stagnating, the budgets are stagnating. And the reason for that is that the central government is trying to sideline these non contributory pension schemes under NSAP in favor of contributory schemes, in particular, the Atala Pension Scheme, Atala Pension Yojana, uh, which is a contributory scheme not of much use to the poorest people because poor people can't afford to contribute and they can't afford to trust the government to uh, pay their pension 20 or 30 years down the line after they, they have contributed for all these years. Moreover, this Atal Pension Yojana is an old age scheme, an old age pension scheme. There is no provision under that for disability pensions. So basically the central government is trying to phase out disability pensions um, by moving towards this contributory scheme, which have no provisions for persons with disabilities. I think it's quite important to be aware of this abdication or impending abdication of responsibility on the part of the central government and uh, recognize the danger it presents for all persons with disabilities. I'll end here. Thank you once again for inviting me and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for- I don't know if I mentioned the, what you said, <laughs> say, but you can say it if, if I didn't. No, interestingly, uh, well, National Foundation, uh, sorry, Disability has sent a mail out today because uh, Aruna Ma'am and you both were talking about disability pension. Yes. And in the Rajiv Sabha, the yes. minister has given a statement today. Right. You know, the disability pension starting at 100 rupees, minimum is 100 rupees in uh, Mizoram. The yes. highest is being paid at the moment in Andhra Pradesh, 3,000 rupees. In Pondicherry, between 2,000 to 3,800. And uh, so that's, that's the range. range. But every, every all other places is 500, 300, 700, 1,200, like that. So yeah, but the, the, the central contribution is only 200 rupees. So most of this money is coming from the states. So yes. I was drawing attention, I was drawing attention to the application of the center. At the state level, there is more action, but I think it's important to insist also on the responsibility of the central government. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And what I was uh, referring to was actually a study done by, I think Dr. Amrit Sen presented it a long time ago. And uh, he was talking about uh, if poverty lines are adjusted to reflect the fact that disability absorbs substantial amounts of both time and money, right. poverty <laughs> rates for disabled people will be even higher. And he gave the figures like poverty rate for people with disability, 23.1% versus non-disabled, 17.9%. But after including expense, expenses associated with being disabled, Right. Poverty rate in people with disabilities shot up to 47.4%. Right, so it's the same point. I was making the same yes. point. Yes. In a more convoluted <laughs> way, we are making it in one sentence, but that is the precisely the point. So, so basically, the standard figures hide poverty among persons with disabilities. I think that's the point too. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to you for making it so well. <laughs> no, thanks, John. Thank you very much. <clears throat>